And you're off. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the third Tuesday of the month, which means it's time for Vinegar and Spice and Everything Nice, featuring the wonderful vinegars from Thomas Allen of California Balsamic and the amazing spices from Nick DeVorn of Local Spicery. They're going to be making multiple recipes. Thomas's recipes will be featuring the flavor of the month, ginger balsamic. And Nick is going to be introducing a new amazing barbecue spice blend that has knocked my socks off. Please welcome them both to the show. Hi, guys. How are you today? Wonderful to see you, see you Chef. I'm going, going to be seeing you. In, I'm going to be seeing you both in person next month. I'm so excited. You'll have to give us your new address out there because we don't know where we're going. <laughs> oh, you're funny. That's how. Okay, I guess that would help you get here. Great. So, Thomas, ginger balsamic is one of the newer flavors, isn't it? We developed that one about a, a year and a half ago, probably during COVID. We came out with that one because we realized. We had the teriyaki with fresh uh, garlic and ginger, but then we're, there were customers who simply asked, can't we just have a ginger balsamic? And we thought, oh, that would be crazy easy to do with organic ginger powder that we use. And uh, it's been a, a wonderful product ever since we developed it, uh, you know, a year and a half, two years ago. Yeah, it's very good. We have lots of people who like it. So that's, that's a wonderful thing. And, yeah, Linda, who's watching live, said she just bought it and she loves it. Linda, you're an extremely smart young lady. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice because it's, I, I you know, the, the, the dark ones and the, the clear ones, they're totally different. And so it's nice to have, you know, the flavors be available in both. And And the main reason why we use more white balsamic than dark balsamic is simply that you can see the ingredients inside a clear white balsamic. Our, our ginger and uh, onion and cucumber, those would all be completely black and you couldn't see inside of it. And chef, as you know, your curry balsamic, if we use the dark balsamic, you wouldn't see that there's probably a quarter inch of, of curry uh, spice powder at the bottom of the bottle that has to be shook up every time you use it. So that's really important that you can see it and blend it properly. So everything is off the bottom or the top of the bottle. And that's why we use more white than we do dark. Interesting. Would you say the white's a little bit sweeter? It actually is not. It it's is not. Um, 30 calories a tablespoon for the white balsamic and 36 calories for the dark. Very interesting. Yeah. Who would have thunk it? Not me. Hey, chef, as on a personal note, today is one of the most important days in my uh, personal bowling career. Tonight's the last night of the season. And, uh, and if I can do just about my average, I will finish the season at a 220 average um, if I can just do a normal night. So I have been nervous <laughs> last night. And this morning uh, about going to uh, to the bowling alley in Windsor tonight and, and for the last night of the season. And this has been a lifelong goal to average 220 for an entire season, which is crazy that, high. That is incredible. Do you ever practice your bowling on bottles of California balsamic vinegar? <laughs> a little expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe empty ones or the, I could do that on a very small scale with the little 1.6 ounce mini, mini bottles. <laughs> They're yeah. plastic. Well, we wish, Much you less every, messy. We, we wish you every success tonight. Maybe you can Thank you, Chef. Out there. It's a thriller. Have you ever bowled a perfect game? Ever bowled a 300 game? As a matter of fact, my darling bride, Ethel, can I have that right there? Uh, thank you. So, um, this is an actual pin from lanes uh, 13 and 14 on March the 4th, 2014. And this is an actual ring that they give you when you bowl a 300 game. 
And uh, that's my very first one. And I bowled another 300 just this past summer uh, when Ethel was uh, watching. Uh, she came to watch that one night and she saw me throw a perfect game. So I've had two in my life. And uh, and yeah, it's very exciting. It's nerve wracking. Trust me. To bowl the uh, 11th and 12th strike uh, is very nerve wracking, but um, done it twice. And I hope to do it again tonight. Well, we wish you every success. Thank you. Thank you. So, all right. So let's get the show on the road here. The first uh, recipe is from our friend Susan, and uh, she's done a ginger balsamic glazed carrots. And if you're a ginger fan, this is a, a, a recipe that you're really going to like because it is strong ginger. Um, now, the ingredients, a pound of carrots peeled and sliced two tablespoons of our ginger balsamic, a tablespoon of date syrup, a clove of minced garlic, a tablespoon of fresh ginger grated, a tablespoon of cornstarch, and some chopped parsley for garnish. Now, super simple, as you can imagine. Preheat your oven to 400 and line a baking sheet with parchment paper. In a large bowl, toss the sliced carrots in a little bit of water to wet them, um, and put a little bit of pepper on them, if you like. Transfer the carrots to the pre-prepared baking sheet and roast for 20 to 25 minutes, or until they're tender and lightly browned. Uh, you can put them in an air fryer if you like to do that as well. While the carrots are roasting, prepare the ginger balsamic glaze. In a small saucepan, whisk together ginger balsamic, date syrup, minced garlic, the gin grated ginger, and cornstarch. Cook over medium heat, stirring constantly, because it can burn with all that sweetness in there, until the mixture thickens and starts to bubble. Remove the roasted carrots from the oven and transfer them to a large bowl. Pour in the ginger balsamic glaze over the carrots and toss them to coat. Garnish the carrots with chopped parsley and serve as a piping hot side dish. Thank you very much. And... And that's it. So now when we just tried that, we, we finished the glaze about uh, 25 minutes ago and, uh, and we tried it and I went, wow, anybody who likes ginger, this is strong and you're going to like it a lot because it's a wonderful side dish. So it, thank you, it Susan. Looks like, uh, it looks like something you'd get in a, like an Asian restaurant. It looks delicious. Mm -hmm. And and the flavor of it, I mean, the the sauce that we're doing, because it really thickens up, you have to be really careful, because it can get too thick. Don't let as it cools a little bit, it gets even thicker. So don't let it get too thick in the saucepan, because uh, it will thicken up as it cools down. So just be aware of that. All right. So there's recipe number one. That was quick and easy. Thank you, Susan. Remember, you're going to get two complimentary eight ounce bottles of your uh, favorite balsamic. So uh, send us an email with what you'd like, Susan. OK. And now a little dessert action. This is uh, a ginger balsamic strawberry shortcake. Mm. Now, this is uh, the ingredients to make the cake are a cup of almond flour a quarter cup of date powder, a quarter cup of unsweetened applesauce, a half a cup of almond milk, teaspoon of baking powder, a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, teaspoon of vanilla extract, two cups of fresh strawberries sliced, and two tablespoons of the ginger balsamic. So you wanna preheat your oven to, to, 37, to, to 350 using a nine inch non stick or silicone cake pan. In a large bowl, mixing bowl, whisk together the flour, date powder, baking powder, baking soda, and then add the applesauce, almond milk, and vanilla extract to the bowl. Using a hand mixer or a stand mixer, beat the mixture on a low speed until everything is well combined. Now you pour the batter into the prepared cake pan and bake for 20 25 minutes or until a toothpick inserted uh, into the center comes out clean. While the shortcake is baking, prepare the ginger balsamic strawberries. In a small bowl, toss the sliced strawberries with the ginger balsamic until they're well coated. And once the shortcake is done baking, remove it from the oven and let it cool in the pan for a few minutes. 
Then remove the shortcake from the pan and let it cool completely on a wire rack. Slice the shortcake in half horizontally and using a serrated knife. Place the bottom half of the shortcake on a serving plate and spoon half of the ginger balsamic strawberries on top. Cover the top of half of the shortcake and spoon the remaining strawberries on top. And uh, that's what we did. We garnished with the strawberries. So this is the final product here. Oh, so that's a wonderful, and, and now it's strawberry season. Uh, so well, at least in California it is. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing. Now, when we did this, we baked this uh, the cake last night, and I'm glad we did because we had a little bit of a challenge. The recipe, I think, originally called for normal flour, and we wanted to use almond flour. So we did. But when we put uh, every, all the ingredients just as it was meant for, to prepare it, we put it into the cake pan. We did not use parchment paper. That was a mistake. You should use parchment paper for this because the almond flour is much, much lighter, as you know. And when we did that, we tried to turn it over to get the cake to come out. And it came out in 12 different small pieces. It just crumbled out. And, and we went, oh, we're going to have to make this again. So we used one and a half cups of almond flour, which was important to make it a little bit thicker. And, and then we lined that with parchment paper and we were able to pull the finished cake out with the paper, let it uh, cool down for a little bit. And then we turned it carefully upside down and we were able to peel the paper right off. So that worked beautifully. But we also found that it didn't rise very much at all. So instead of cutting it horizontally, we just cut it in half and then put one piece on top of the other. So, and, and I think because of the applesauce, uh, it didn't rise up very much. But moist as can be and delicious, oh, absolutely. So it's a wonderful recipe, but it just depends on the ingredients that you're using. And the almond flour makes it a little bit uh, of a challenge to get it out of the pan if you don't use parchment paper. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. It looks delicious. So those are good ones. So Nick, it's all yours, my friend. Oh, thank you, Thomas. It's good to see you. How have you been? A uh, busy little camper out here. We're, we're getting ready for some big changes in our life soon. That's great. I can't wait to hear all about them. Well, today, uh, <clears throat> today we're going to be talking barbecue. We're going to take a deep, deep dive into barbecue, which is, uh, you know, everybody thinks they know what barbecue is, but there's some history behind it, and uh, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. We think of barbecue uh, uh, as a traditionally American dish, um, and it is. Uh, it, there also are traditions for barbecue that you'll find in, uh, in other English-speaking countries, such as uh, uh, Great Britain and, uh, and Australia. Um, <clears throat> but most people think of barbecue as coming from the American South. What people don't think about is <clears throat> it's actually, it is actually an authentic indigenous American dish. Uh, and uh, we've, uh, at Local Spicery, for quite some time, we've we've carried a bar a uh, barbecue uh, rub. We called it bootjack barbecue. Um, <clears throat> it's a, it's quite a nice uh, uh, barbecue rub. It was a uh, it was a blend that we did for a chef in San Francisco originally, who was looking for uh, a barbecue uh, blend that they could put on uh, house potatoes. Uh, believe it or not. Um, and it's been a big success, but <clears throat> I've been talking for some time about reblending it specifically for the plant-based community to blend it without the salt. Uh, we uh, wanted to get rid of the brown sugar that was in it and make it something that's a little bit healthier. Uh, but the other thing that I was able to do uh, with this new blend, and I'll put it right out, this blend we're calling Bayou Barbecue. Uh, it says right on the label, uh, no added salt. Um, the Bayou Barbecue uh, instead of using paprika for uh, uh, the base of the of the blend, um, which is pretty typical, uh, I'm kind of on a kick right now of indigenous cooking. Uh, just got back from uh, from a week in uh, in Oaxaca, and I got all this stuff going through my head. So instead, we did a blend of uh, of Central American chilies uh, uh, ground, very very 
low to, to no heat type chilies. There's, there's some uh, uh, Anaheim chilies and some Guajillo chilies. So you get a much, much rich, richer, more complex flavor. And that complex flavor kind of helps compensate for the fact that there's no salt in it. So let's get back to where barbecue comes from. Um, uh, the word barbecue, a lot of people will say it, it comes from the Spanish word barbacoa, because a lot of us are familiar with barbacoa as a, uh, uh, a Mexican and a Spanish dish. It refers to a method of cooking as well as, as the dish itself, uh, the method of cooking being cooked in a pit uh, at, a slow, at a low temperature over a long period of time. But barbacoa itself uh, comes from the, uh, uh, the late 1400s. Uh, uh, there's a guy named Christopher Columbus who uh, sailed across the Atlantic Ocean and landed in the island of Hispaniola where the natives of the Caribbean, and by the way, the natives of, uh, of Florida as well, uh, uh, had a method of cooking that they called uh, uh, Barbaraca or Barbaracu. Uh, and that, uh, in fact, literally translated from their language means, you know, the structure of sticks put together over a fire. Uh, and that's where barbecue comes from. It is, in fact, as I said, an original indigenous dish. Um, uh, I'm going to just kind of kind of quickly go through uh, uh, some quick, quick options. We've only been cooking with this for a few weeks, uh, but uh, we're pretty excited about all of the options that we have now to be, be using our barbecue blend uh, in our, our uh, plant-based cooking. Um, <clears throat> the uh, 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 first thing I think I'm going to do is we're doing a, uh, a barbecue bean. And uh, the barbecue bean is, uh, you know, everything, you know, everything I do here is simple. Uh, I, I started uh, here in the uh, uh, here on my side, it's just a pot where I've sauteed one small onion, uh, uh, not coarsely chopped, not fine, right in the middle, about a quarter inch, uh, quarter inch uh, uh, dice on the onion. And I've sauteed that down just to the point where they're soft. Um, the other two things that I've done in advance is I've, I've uh, cooked a, uh, a pot of pinto beans. And uh, I, I'll give you my recipe for pinto beans. I do them on the, in the instant pot. Uh, usually I'll, I'll, I'll do them without soaking them overnight, but I actually had the beans in my hand last night and I thought, why not? So I did soak them over, uh, overnight last night. Uh, I use a pound of pinto beans, uh, six cups of water. Uh, I have, a, I put in a coarsely chopped, uh, onion. Uh, I put a bay leaf and I put a few strips of kombu in and that's it. Uh, uh, they come out, uh, uh, you know, with a just just a, uh, a subtle, nice flavor to them, and uh, uh, the uh, the skins are are nice and soft and well conditioned. They're very pleasant. Um, if I'm if I've pre-soaked them overnight, I'll cook them at uh, 15 minutes, and at the end of the 15 minutes, I, I do a uh, quick release. I don't let them release over time. If I uh, if I did not, and I just threw the beans in, I would do it for 45 minutes. Same thing. I do a, I do a quick release on the steam. Um, the other thing that I've done in advance uh, relates to uh, to the blender, which I use a lot. Uh, I did, uh, uh, you know, last month a lot of people complained about the noise of the blender, so we're not going to do that again. So I've done this in advance. Uh, in the blender, all that I've done is I put a uh, just a can of chopped tomato. I think it's what is it, 13 and a half ounce, just a standard size can. Uh, I put two dates. I put uh, two tablespoons of the uh, of the new Bayou barbecue blend. Uh, and I put one tablespoon of uh, 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 cider vinegar. And, uh, and I, I pureed it until you can't detect any, uh, any you know, chunkiness from the dates and everything's nice and smooth. And we're gonna fire this up. We'll just get this heating. Um, the one thing I will say, you know, when you're, when you're using, uh, you know, essentially uncooked tomatoes like that, uh, it's going to have a slightly astringent flavor, and ultimately you're going to want to cook it down. Uh, we won't have enough time to cook it completely down, but we'll get it. We'll get it uh, starting to simmer. Um, I do recommend that we do this over a period of time, say at least 20, 25 minutes of simmering. Or if you wanted to do baked beans, you could put this whole thing together, put it in a baking dish, uh, uh, and uh, put it in your oven, 300, 350, 375 for a half hour or so and you'd have wonderful baked beans. Um, as you got, because I put the, 
I put the two dates in here. It's got that nice sweet tangy flavor that we look for in uh, in baked beans. But this is really just a sweet tangy spicy, essentially a barbecue sauce. We're gonna heat that up. I'm gonna go get my beans over here. So while it's heating, I'm just going to transfer some beans over. If you're doing this using canned beans, um, I think I did this the other night using canned beans, and I put three three standard size uh, cans of beans in. All I'm going to do is just transfer some over. There's some combo we take out. We'll just transfer some beans over till it looks about right. I'm a big, I, I love beans. I was gonna say I love beans, but actually I think I love any kind of uh, legume. That was another, uh, the second of our of our pieces of kombu. Hey Nick, sorry to inter interrupt. What's kombu? Sure. Kombu, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a form of kelp. Um, it's, uh, it's mostly known from, uh, from uh, Japan, but since Fukushima, uh, we've kind of stopped ordering any uh, sea vegetables that come from Japan. Uh, these ones we get, uh, they're uh, wild harvested off the coast of Maine, um, but they come in uh, about six inch long dried sheets of kelp. Uh, it does uh, three things for you. One is it imparts a, uh, a, a very pleasant umami flavor. In fact, it, you know, the definition of umami was based on the flavor of kelp, of the kabu kelp. Uh, it, uh, it gives you kind of a, a slightly salty flavor feeling to it. You won't feel like you're missing the salt that you normally would put when you're cooking your beans. And the third really important thing is it conditions the skin of the beans and it, uh, uh, it uh, makes them uh, so that the, the skin of the beans is going to be soft and pliable and, and not hard, which is one of the reasons why people put salt in the, uh, in the water. So. Just uh, drop a couple of strips of kombu in, and it's uh, and it's uh, nice and easy and tasty and and delicious. Okay, so that's it on the beans. I'm just going to let this sit here and simmer for a little while while I move over. So, what is a uh, what's a barbecue without steak, right? So we're going to be cooking steak. Of course, the steaks are going to be these beautiful uh, cauliflower steaks. What I did is I, uh, I just washed the cauliflower and I sliced it into four pieces. Um, if uh, if uh, you try this at home and you're frustrated because you're really only getting two steaks out of it and these end pieces just fall apart, happens to me every time. In fact, I just got really lucky that this held together like that. Usually I'll get two steaks out from the middle. I cut them, they're about, a, about an inch thick. And then the ends fall apart into florets and I'll serve the steaks with the florets all around them. Um, super, super easy, almost, you know, almost uh, nothing to them. All that I'm gonna do in here, I've got some uh, uh, maple syrup. Uh, it's about a tablespoon. Um, the idea is not really to make these sweet. We're not trying to make a dessert. I just wanna get a little tiny bit of the syrup on each one of these things to help the, uh, uh, Help the, the spice blend stick to the, uh, uh, the cauliflower. I see just a really quick drizzle here. I'm not even going to use all of this, just a very little amount. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to insult you by telling you how much to use. I just shake it on uh, and I shake on, a, you know, I like a fair amount. You could go very light if you wanted, but I like it fairly dark. One thing I did want to point out. Uh, um, I do have this on a, uh, on a sheet of, uh, of parchment paper. It's just, you know, it's so much easier to clean if you do it that way. Okay. And that's, that's how it looks when I've got it seasoned. This goes in the oven at 375 degrees. <clears throat> Cooks about 40 minutes. Just wait until it's nice and, uh, uh, nice and soft. So uh, one of my, uh, you know, one of my very, very early cooking idols was Julia Child. And one of the things that I learned from her is this trick. 
So now that the cauliflower is done, I'm going to pull it out of the oven. And this is how it looks when it's been cooked. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> oh, wow. So, <laughs> uh, you, how many, how many thousand times, AJ, have you, uh, have you just roasted cauliflower in the oven? It's a very, very quick, simple, uh, simple dish. But what I'm going to do with these, and I think I'm going to take, uh, put this down here. I'm going to take some of these out because I need a little bit of room on this plate. Um, I did make also a basic sauce, and uh, you know I am, a, a, you know, if you watch. Uh, if you, if you watch my uh, my videos with AJ, you'll see that I, I'm always doing some kind of a sauce. It just, for me, it, it, it connects the food, it puts it together, and it's it's probably the best way that the food connects with spices, at least it is for me. So I make I made a simple sauce. This is the kind of sauce that I usually make that we put, we use it as a, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, as a salad dressing. We'll put it over bowls, we'll put it in wraps, but it's it's just a, uh, a cashew cream, half a cup each of uh, cashew and water. Uh, I added uh, 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 one tablespoon of the uh, Bayou uh, barbecue blend and one tablespoon of uh, cider vinegar to it. It's got a beautiful uh, orange color and it just gives you a little sauce that's gonna, uh, my gorgeous, there we go. Little sauce, and it's gonna soak into the cauliflower. Okay. Need a little bit more here. Okay, and then I'm going to get a, bit, a nice bowl here so you can see the beans through it. That looks nice and pretty. And I have my, well, I'll get a different, uh, different spoon this time. Okay. Some of my very favorite things to use a, a barbecue blend for in plant-based cooking. Um, you know, the first thing that I had to try was, uh, uh, you know, we do, uh, we do grilled portobello mushrooms a lot. And uh, just to sprinkle some of the uh, barbecue, uh, uh, the Bio barbecue blend onto the uh, portobellos, it's a absolutely perfect pairing, delicious. Um, uh, I haven't tried this yet, but I'm really looking forward to, you know, we do uh, uh, jackfruit full pork style. Uh, I, I'll be using this blend uh, in that to, uh, for the barbecue flavoring in that. And speaking of pulled pork, what's pulled pork uh, without the slaw? I think just adding a little bit of barbecue, so barbecue blend into the slaw would be spectacular. Um, uh, sweet potato fries we've done a couple of times. They're delicious. Uh, uh, wraps and bowls, as I mentioned, you can either do them in a sauce like this or you can do them with uh, uh, just, just sprinkle it. Use it as a uh, as a finishing type sauce, finishing type uh, uh, seasoning. But you can see there it is finished, very quick and simple, uh, and absolutely delicious. Where uh, the idea is, uh, you know, bringing regional American favorite dishes. That uh, this is probably the first one that where it wasn't originally even intended for uh, for vegetables. I mean, it's clearly barbecue was originally intended for meats, but it's such an important flavor to us and to go back to, and it's great to have it uh, in the uh, in the repertoire. And so uh, uh, I do have uh, a couple of, uh, of kind of housekeeping. The first is uh, if you order from us, uh, the best way to make sure that you're getting a, a product that is uh, whole food plant-based Go through Chef AJ's uh, webpage, which is www.localspicery.com slash Chef AJ. Uh, if you do that, you will get uh, two free samples of SOS free blends. Uh, you can request, and we do our very best to, uh, to satisfy people's requests. It's not 100%. Sometimes you'll get a note or a call from us that we can't comply, but we really try. And the second is uh, just to let you know, this is such a new blend for, um, such a new blend for us. And uh, I was telling Charles just a little while ago, we had a uh, had a blow up here at the mill 
and uh, uh, temporarily we can't print any labels. So uh, it is up on the website. We can take orders. Probably won't ship till early next week. Um, but other than that, we're uh, we're really excited about it and looking forward to sharing it with you. Well, I put it on, I didn't have portobello mushrooms, but I put it on regular mushrooms and I air fried it and that blend was incredible. And I, I made potato chips with it. I made barbecue potato chips in the microwave. I, I love it on mushrooms. It is so good with mushrooms. Yep. It's a good one. Nick, you rock, my friend. Uh, that dish looks fantastic. And Ethel and I are absolutely portobello fanatics as well. So good for you. Okay, so um, continuing with our cute little story, um, Nick, as I'm sure you've uh, learned in the past and, and how the business ups and downs along the way in the years that you've been in business, about 15 to 18 years ago when I was working with a woman named uh, Sean B.A., she was the one who suggested that I start trying to sell oils and balsamic vinegars. Her father was uh, for any of you that are in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, 15 years ago, there was a fella named Dr. Bob who had a series of, of, uh, of medical uh, supervised weight loss clinics in that area. And he had commercials on television called Hi, Dr. Bob. And he was quite famous. Well, uh, his daughter, Sean B.A., when she was working with us, introduced our company to him and he said, let's put all of your flavors that were oil free into these clinics. And he had about 20,000 patients that signed up with these clinics every year. And they were going to have one bottle of our uh, marinade, a salad dressing marinade for each customer who signed up for this. And we just thought, oh my gosh, this will be the biggest client we've ever had. And one week before this was supposed to uh, be signed in our in a, in, in a paperwork, papers to be signed, the manager who was making all this happen somehow got some kind of little infection. She said, oh, this will be fine. Don't worry. And three days later, it got worse. And the next day she went into the hospital and the next day she died. And all of a sudden, the main person who was going to get this deal going passed away and we were in panic mode. And of course, as all family businesses happen, uh, her brother was the one who took over that spot. And the relationship between Champier's brother and her was beyond horrible. And he ixnayed the deal, and the, the deal never happened. So, you know, when something you think is going to be so fantastic is right on your plate, and then something happens, and it's gone. And that was uh, uh, one of the saddest uh, deal-breaking events, simply because she didn't take care of a little infection, didn't go have it looked at. And a week later, she had died. And what a shame that that happened to her and her family. And, and we thought, what a shame for our business that it just all of a sudden didn't happen the way we thought it would. But good things happen to those who wait. And 15 years later, Chef, we met you and, and life is dramatically better. So thank you for coming into our life. Oh, thank so, you. The, uh, the last uh, dish is uh, from uh, Eileen, uh, Eileen M. And she's made a ginger noodle bowl with kale and tofu. And she said, this recipe is so delicious. There are three parts, but it is still not difficult and worth the effort. So the ingredients, two to three uh, tablespoons of our ginger balsamic, one 14 ounce block of firm or extra firm tofu. We use the extra firm. And for the dressing, a quarter cup of liquid aminos, a quarter cup of agave syrup, two tablespoons of our ginger balsamic, uh, a clove of garlic minced, the zest of one lime, and two tablespoons from that lime of the juice. For the main bowl, you need eight ounces of rice noodles cooked according to the package directions. And note, rinse well with cold water to prevent clumping or overcooking. Uh, three green onions diced, 
four cups of thinly sliced kale. And she said, uh, Lacinato kale, also known as dinosaur kale, is the very tender and works the best. But any kale cut into slivers will work as well. An avocado cubed, a half a cup of cilantro leaves, and three tablespoons of sesame seeds lightly pan toasted. And she makes another note saying, lightly toasting the sesame seeds enhances the flavor. Use medium heat to stir and start washing closely after four minutes. The seeds can go from golden brown to burnt in a minute or two. So you have to watch those carefully. Now, for this recipe, uh, since Ethel and I, neither of us are fans of, uh, of cilantro, because we don't have the gene in our DNA that likes it, we used basil instead. And we also uh, didn't have any kale, so we used some arugula. So again, with, with these recipes, making it your own customized way works out just right. So now the directions. Press the tofu to remove excess fluid. Cut it into bite-sized cubes. Pour the marinade over it and let it marinate at least 10 minutes. Bake at 375 for 20 minutes until lightly crisp and set it aside. Make the dressing by whisking in a bowl or using a shaker jar and set that aside. Combine the main bowl ingredients into a large bowl, add the tofu, pour in the dressing and stir to combine. So it is actually very easy to do all this. And she's got a little bit more notes down here. An alternate way to prepare the tofu is to freeze the entire tofu package overnight or longer. On cooking day, remove and allow the thaw while still in the container. So let it thaw in the container. This can be room temperature or put in a big bowl of warm water. Once mostly thawed, open the package and gently squeeze the whole block of tofu over your sink. About a half a cup of water will drain and the tofu will look dry and spongy. Cut the bite-sized pieces and pour the balsamic marinade over it. The tofu will readily absorb the balsamic. You can bake immediately or store in the refrigerator to bake later. The freezer uh, will work well for the lime as well. Freezing and then thawing the lime weakens the membranes and allow the juice to release readily. It also is easier to zest a frozen lime. I never thought of that. Chef, have you ever zested a frozen lime? No, but it sounds like maybe it would be easier, huh? I have to say, because you're always kind of struggling with the lime. And because it's so much harder, you'll be able to zest it a little bit easier. But you have to be really careful because the, the zest of the lime is really thin. And you'll get into the pith pretty easily. So uh, and you don't want that, uh, you know, the bitterness of that. So that's it. And here is this beautiful recipe of ginger noodle bowl with kale and tofu. So um, that one here of the three dishes is my favorite uh, of these three. And I, I just think this one is a, is a fantastic one. The, the, uh, the dressing on it was for my taste, not too strong a ginger. For those who love the ginger, the carrot one is much stronger, but the, the noodle one here was more subtle. And I like that a lot. And Ethel, she's a big fan of the strawberry with the ginger uh, on that one as well. So uh, ginger can be used for sweet and savory or, or sweet or savory, works both ways. So that's really nice. So those are our three recipes for this month, Chef. I hope you appreciate them. I love them. And what is the flavor of the month next month? And maybe talk about how people can submit their recipes and win two free bottles in the flavor of their choice. Uh, excellent. Uh, next month is going to be our pineapple, island pineapple balsamic. Uh, kind of a whimsical one out there that always makes me think of heading out to Maui and going to Little Beach and playing in the waves. That's something that is my favorite pastime to do. And uh, so pineapple be it. And chef, I have to think we're going to make your um, coleslaw, coleslaw recipe. It is killer. And we're going to have to make it to uh, reacquaint anybody who hasn't seen your video that you made about three years ago. Um, I think I glanced at it and you had somewhere near 180,000 views on it. So I'm more than impressed. Wow. Thank you. 
And uh, whenever you uh, send us an email with any recipes that you have uh, for our pineapple balsamic and um, uh, send it to orders at californiabalsamic.com and we will look at them and, and hopefully we'll get uh, anywhere from three to five recipes and we'll choose the ones we like. Even if your recipe is not chosen to be on the broadcast, we will put your recipe and your name on our recipe page, which I think has, you know, again, we're getting three to five recipes every month. We're up to uh, probably 150 SOS free recipes on there now. And yes, chef, one day a cook SOS free cookbook will happen. Um, that's when we'll have more time on our hands in a few months. So, and speaking of uh, later on, we're Ethel and I will be at the Clayton Art and Wine Festival, uh, which is uh, oh, you know, half hour um, from downtown San Francisco in the East Bay. Uh, it's a beautiful little town, and we'll be at that event on the. 29th and 30th of this month so a week from this weekend that's where we'll be for the for the weekend those two days wow thank you hey nick somebody's asking about the new blend thing is it, it they, they're not seeing it on my page but is it, is it in the store yet no not in the store yet we'll uh, we'll be bringing it uh next weekend down to the store so not not this coming weekend but the weekend after it'll be in the store Okay. And you don't, you don't really have like a flavor of the month, like Thomas, right? We don't, but my, my guess is next, uh, next month, I'm going to try to do something uh, uh, from Oaxaca. It'll probably be a, a, a mole or a sauce uh, and some tortillas. It sounds great. Well, guys, thank you so much. It's you always a pleasure to see you, Chef. Yeah, we might be moving you guys back to 2 p.m. next month, so make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel. Hit that notification bell. Please consider subscribing because I really want to get to 200,000 if I can. And thank you guys so much. It's always a pleasure to see both of you, and I'll see you in person in May. Thank you, Chef. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Nick. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time for Stefan Esser, MD. He's going to be talking about the risk of cancer, the greens and blues. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.